Welcome to topic three of network security concepts. And in this topic, there are three subtopics, and those are risk mitigation, incident response, and we also have some social, ethical, and legal implications. So, firstly, risk mitigation. So I put a little quote down below about risk mitigation and the best form of risk, mit risk mitigation is user training. Okay, so the best way to try to prevent or to try to work against and reduce risk is to actually train the people who are working in your organization. Okay, now, um, cyber attack risk. So, According to a recent report, cybercrime costs businesses close to $600 billion annually. And this is up from $445 billion in 2014. And that was 2018. That's, that's three years ago now. So we can imagine that that trend is in the upward direction, especially with the increase in online uh, working, working from home. So, a 2017 survey estimated that a typical finance institution faces an average of 85 targeted cyber attacks every year, a third of which are successful. And an IMF, the International Monetary Fund, modelling exercise published in 2018, estimates that annual losses to financial institutions from cyber attacks could reach several hundred billion dollars a year. So this can really eat into bank profits. And one example of not so much a cyber attack, but an example of an IT problem eating into bank uh, profits, I think it was the year 2019 or the year 2018 uh, when Lloyd's TSB or just the TSB branch of Lloyd's attempted to migrate their online banking from the existing, I, th I believe it was the old Bank of Scotland system that they had running, to uh, a, a new system. And this actually failed. It, it caused them lots of problems. Um, and the end of year, I think that it had basically removed all of their problems. The bank basically made no profit that year. Um, I remember them discussing the, the, the figures on the news. So certainly IT problems, including cyber attack, um, can cause huge, huge and devastating problems for large organizations um, eating into their products. And of course, when an organization like this, like a, a large bank doesn't make any profits, then the staff that work for that organization don't get their Christmas bonus. Um, they might have to close branches and, and shut down various departments. They might have to downsize. People lose their jobs. So there's a there's a knock on effect from these things happening. Okay, so risk supervision. So here's a quote from Wilson et al. 2019. The goal of cybersecurity risk supervision should be to influence, incentivize, and shape firms' cybersecurity capabilities. Supervision activities to build resilience should include the following. Identify the threat landscape. Map the cyber and financial network. Create coherent regulation. Conduct supervisory assessment. Establish formal information sharing and reporting mechanisms provide adequate response and recovery, and ensure preparedness of supervisory agencies. So there is a description of risk supervision. So risk control. In order to control risk, first of all, we have to assess risk. And this is in order to determine the level of risk that we have. So security professionals should always be aware of the impact a risk can have on an organization. And organizations must develop a risk 
posture. So what's their position um, in terms of risk? What, what's their, um, what do they think? Do they want to, to be very, to, you know, to live in a very high risk environment? Do they have a very low risk tolerance? Do they want very low risk? Are they willing to accept medium risk? Um, so they need to have a risk posture. What's their position in terms of risk? And there are many actual methods to quantify risk. And here's two examples. There's a risk formula and a risk impact matrix. So I have over here this Venn diagram, which has threat, asset, vulnerability, and in the middle here, we have risk. Okay. So here is a risk formula. And that risk formula can be written as risk is equal to threat times vulnerability times consequence. I've also seen this C over here being times cost as well. Okay. So risk equals threat times vulnerability is a classic risk formula. Now, um, we can calculate what the threat of something is, um, what the weakness of something is, what the intent, intent capability of something is, and what the consequences are. And we could give these a metric. We could say, you know, threat level between 1 and 10, uh, vulnerability level between 1 and 10, consequence between 1 and 10. Okay? Now, if you imagine, if the threat was one, the vulnerability was one, and the consequence was one, then risk would be equal to one times one times one, so the risk level would be one. Okay, now let's say we assigned um, threat level to be 10, vulnerability level to be 10, consequence to be 10, we would have 10 times 10 times 10, risk level would be 1,000. Okay, and we were using a scale where we only went up to 10, the highest possible risk would be a thousand. So that would be the highest, absolute highest risk. Now, we can actually write out risk levels on a risk impact matrix. So here we have a table that I've made. Um, very painstakingly typed this out. And we have the likelihood of something happening up here. So traveling up this y-axis here starting off very unlikely all the way up to very likely and then we have the impact traveling along this way starting off with negligible which means not really that important to minor to moderate to significant to severe okay so let's say we have something that is very likely to happen and the consequences are going to be very severe, that would be in this high category here. Let's say we have something very unlikely to happen, okay, and the risk of that happening was very low. It was negligible, okay, the impact was negligible. We would categorize that as low. So <clears throat> there are all different sorts of combinations we can have. We can have there's a possibility something will happen and it's got a moderate risk. That would land us right in the middle of this risk impact matrix here. And when we were talking about the risk posture before, okay, you need to figure out what it is that you're willing to tolerate. Okay, are you willing to tolerate up to say here? So anything, anything in here, you're not that bothered about anything here you're very angry about and we need to do we need to take action immediately okay um or do you have a much more um conservative risk policy where you're not willing to tolerate anything anything in this area so this anything up here is has to be dealt with must be dealt with okay now it's very important that you trust the person who's classifying the risk. For example, I have worked in some networks before with some people who I had a strong belief didn't know what they were doing. And they would often come to me and say something like, oh, it's a disaster. It's an absolute disaster. This is wrong with the network. And it would really just be a case of me 
logging into the network and clicking one button and it would be fixed. So in their mind, they were classifying this as a very high risk over here. But actually, I would have classified it as a sort of low medium possibility. So it's important that whoever comes up with these classifications is someone that you trust. So if someone says something's high risk, then you, you need to be able to, to, you know, to trust that, that they're, you, you don't want someone who's going to say that everything's um, high risk all the time. Okay. Um, that's not much use. The other thing as well is um, you need to understand that you should have some sort of default response when something high risk takes place. Okay, so you should have a position on that. Okay, so threat modeling is a popular recent technique. And Microsoft's actually published a book about the process. And a threat model is a structured representation of all the information that affects the security of an application. It's a view of the application and its environment. Threat modeling is a process for capturing, organizing, and analyzing all of this information. So if we know about a specific threat, then we could create a model of this threat and see how that threat will impact our organization. Security policies are an overall general statement produced by a senior management, a policy board, or a committee that dictates what role security plays within that organization. So if your organizational security policy says something, then the members of your organization should stick to that. Now, there are certain factors that security policies should observe. They should be quite generic. So they should be adaptable. They should be non-technical and easily understood. They should provide a mission statement. They should represent business objectives. They should integrate security into everyday business functions. And they should be reviewed. And there should be a version number added to these uh, with the date so that um, each, you know, period of review, whether it be, you know, three months, one year, two years, um, we all know that we're using the latest version of the security policy. And this will have to adapt as the security landscape changes. So um, when coming up with a security policy, um, interesting that it says here that it should be generic in these guidelines. Uh, generic means that you should be able to adapt it to fit different situations. And this can actually be seen in um, things like social media uh, security policies. So what they do is they come up with a very generic statement. And then if someone says something that they think they might disagree with, they'll, you know, block it from their website and they'll say that it violates their community guidelines okay and in some respect that's a security policy a very generic one that they can change okay a very general security policy so there's threat modeling there's security policies what different types of security policies do we have so a regulatory policy ensures that the organization is following standards set by industry regulations, okay? An advisory security policy is just advisory. So, you know, we might strongly suggest that you don't post company non-specific information. We do might strongly suggest you don't take pictures of systems in the office okay um so an informative policy exists simply to inform the reader okay we might strongly suggest that you don't check your online banking on a public wi-fi network okay but it's your it's your online it's your bank account you know i'm just just informing you 
that that might be a bad idea. So those are some types of some security policies. Um, here's some examples. So a regulatory, the organization's data protection policy or a data disposal policy should comply with regulations, okay? Like a financial compliance or financial conduct policy. Then advisory policies would be something like a social media policy. So don't comment on the organization uh, on public social media sites. Don't, you know, talk badly of your, of your employer. Now that's not going to break any, reg you're not breaking any law by doing that. That's why it's an advisory policy, okay? You might be in trouble with your employer, but you're not doing anything illegal by saying, you know, you don't like them on a social media website. And then finally, informative. So just a policy advising people on how to word emails or how best to use the printer. We might say, you know, it would be good if when you print things out, you set it to double-sided and then you will use half of the paper, okay? Reducing the organization's carbon footprint. Okay, that's informative policy, okay? So, um, oh, another good point here as well, down the bottom. Guidelines are advisory or informative and regulatory policies are mandatory, okay? So a mandatory policy means that it's, it's good, you're going to be breaking the law if you break that policy. Then we look at some different types of audit. Now, in security, we can have all different kinds of auditing and we can do all different kinds of auditing, okay? Um, now, auditing is actually a very useful and very helpful thing you can do. So here's some examples of some audits. The first one is a permissions audit. And this can just check what members of staff have permission to access what data and, and when, okay? So if a member of staff were to move department, they might have some legacy permissions from some old department that you might need to remove. An escalation audit is similar to a disaster recovery test. It's basically, you're gonna check the chain of escalation. Now escalation just means moving up, passing something up. So for example, you might pretend that there was a system failure and you might say, okay, so there's a system failure. What are we going to do? What do we do when there's a system failure? Do we all panic uh, and start and start crying? Do we all run out of the building, uh, burning everything? You know, what, what do we do? So let's say we lose some data. What? How do we deal with that? The idea might be that we contact IT and get IT to restore that data, or let's say the data is backed up by an external company. We might contact that company and get them to restore the data. Now, the, the, the purpose of the escalation audit is who do you contact? What's their phone number? Does the phone number work? What's their name? Okay, what time do they work? What, what times are they open? Are they open 24 hours? Do they close at five? Do they open at 8 a.m.? Or do they work weekends? Who are they? Where are they? Can you go to their office? Um, so checking phone numbers are correct, contacts are up to date, um, and things can be recovered. And you might even want to do a little test one day. Let's say we'll delete a file, and then we'll contact IT and get them to restore it, okay? And then we'll say that IT can't restore it, and we'll contact the backup company and get them to restore it, and we'll put, We'll check that everything works and how everything works. So that's an escalation audit. Password audit. When were all the passwords last updated? What's the password policy? Okay, so if the passwords have been the same for five years, then it might be time to increase the uh, minimum password length or complexity and to change all the passwords as well. So some more types of audit. Risk assessments. Um, we already talked about creating a risk impact matrix, a physical security assessment. Um, go around and check that the building locks, is everything secure? 
um, can you get in at the weekend? A backup audit, quite similar to the uh, previous one that we had, the escalation audit. We also got disaster recovery tests, so continuity planning. What would happen if the main server failed? What would you do? Okay. Right, so the next section is incident response. So we've talked about some different types of incidents and, and how to audit them and what the risks are, but um, what do we do uh, when there's an incident? So disaster recovery. Disaster recovery involves a set of policies, tools and procedures to enable the recovery or continuation of vital technology infrastructure. So for example, if you run a company that has a website, what do you do if the website goes offline? How do you recover it? What do we have in place to deal with that? Okay, so um, escalation would be dealing with who we contact, what their phone number is, uh, what the chain of escalation is. So let's say I go to the website and it's down. Who do I speak to? Who do I escalate this issue up to? So do I just keep it to myself? Do I text my mate and say, ah, oh, um, guess what? The website's down, lol, smiley face, and then go home. You know, I would probably say, I want to escalate this to my line manager, they would then want to escalate it to some sort of command center. They would then want to escalate it to the technical director. He would want to escalate it to their website hosting company. So what's the chain? Um, disaster recovery is different because disaster recovery doesn't focus on the kind of chain of escalation. Disaster recovery focuses on what, do, what does each person do? Um, follow, let's say there's a natural disaster, okay? What do we do? The building goes on fire. What do, what do you do? Okay, what do we do? Okay, that's not so much about a kind of chain of escalation, more about how we actually act. You know, so I, I'm trying to think of a good example of a disaster. Um, it would be, let's say um, you accidentally transferred $10,000 to the wrong customer's account. Uh, or you accidentally transferred the wrong amount of money. That would probably be a disaster if that was, you know, significant to the size of company. Um, the classic would be, um, what happens if the server room goes on fire? What do you do? And certainly you would hope that you've done an escalation audit to figure out who you're going to escalate it to. I suppose if it was on fire, the first thing you would do is you phone the fire brigade. Um, but what would actually happen if you lost all your servers, what would you do? You know, what, what, how would you recover? So, you know, I worked for a, a networking company at one point and um, they had some routers, some Wi-Fi routers that were in very remote places. And if these failed, the, you know, what was the plan for that? The plan was that they were gonna drive all the way to this faraway place and replace the router. So disaster recovery tests um, will help prepare for such an event. Change management is the process of approving, scheduling and documenting changes. So let's say, for example, we want to make a change to our main system and that system is currently being used we should probably document what we changed and where, just in case this causes a problem with another part of the system. Okay, so all changes should be logged through some kind of a change management process. And this could be closely tied to a patch management process. Let's say every month or so, you're gonna update the systems. It might be that an update breaks something and you may have to roll back that change. So having a change management process in place would help to resolve that. So digital forensics, a little bit of a different topic. So digital forensics is the process of recovering, interpreting electronic data. And the aim 
of digital forensics is to preserve any evidence in its original form while performing a structured investigation by collecting, identifying and validating the data for the purposes of reconstructing past events. So the digital forensics um, actually has a set of stages and a set of processes. Now, let's say you were to come into an organization on Monday morning and all of the computers were gone. Or let's say you had a very important file and that file had been copied or compromised. How would you tell who copied it? That is where a digital forensic process would come into place. So there's some stages that we have for this. And now I've heard that there's four stages, there's five stages. These are not these are not set in stone, but here are here are kind of a basic overview. So we have identification. So identify any evidence or information. Then preservation. Can we keep the evidence in its original form? Collection. Can we collect information? Analysis. Can we analyze it? Then evaluate it. Then can we report on our findings? So there's a real breakdown of the digital forensic process stage. Now, we're not going to go into this in too much detail because this will be covered in the digital forensics module. Uh, so it's just important to be aware of the different stages of digital forensics. Um, now, I think at this point, um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, hashing algorithms. So um, now I think I've shown most of this class something similar before, but let's say, for example, we have a file and we're going to use that file as evidence. Okay, so it might be a JPEG, it might be a photograph, it might be a Word document. So I'm just going to create a file called um, evidence dot doc. Okay, so we have this file called evidence dot docx. Now, we're going to take a digital signature of this file. Okay, so md5 sum and then evidence dot docx is giving us this. This is the md5 hash of this file here. Okay, so if I copy evidence dot docx to evidence two dot docx okay then i run the md5 sum and i run the md5 sum on evidence two do you think that evidence two will have a different md5 sum let's have a look so as you can see evidence and evidence two have an identical md5 sum okay they're exactly the same and the reason that they're exactly the same, okay, is because the contents of the file is exactly the same. So here we have evidence.docx. This is the secret. Let's do save. Save, save, save. Okay, so now let's get out of VI here. Let's do cat evidence.docx. Okay. So now we have some text in there. So um, let's run MD5 sum on evidence.docx. Okay, we should be able from memory to tell that now the hash sum is totally different, okay? There, so these are completely different numbers now. Now, let's just clear this off, okay? And we're gonna do MD5 sum on evidence.docx and then we're going to open up evidence.docx and we're going to add, all right, just one little bit of text to it, okay? So here is our evidence.docx file here and we're gonna add a full stop dot and then save. Okay, now let's do md5 sum evidence.docx. And you'll see that 
Just adding that one character makes the hash sum completely different. Okay? Now, there is such a thing as an MD5 hash collision. Okay? And the MD5 hash collision, it is possible to have two files that have the same MD5 sum. Very, very difficult, but it is possible because the MD5 sum is quite a small um, hash sum that comes out. So there are longer ones, okay? There is a SHA-256 sum of evidence.docx, okay? There's a SHA-256. There's also a SHA-384 okay, sum, okay? There's a SHA-384 sum. And there's also a SHA-512 sum. By the way, SHA stands for Secure Hashing Algorithm, just in case anybody didn't know. So this one is a very secure uh, hashing algorithm, a very long and complex hashing algorithm. It's unlikely that you'll find any collisions, okay? Two files that will come out with the same 512 sum. However, a hash collision is possible with MD5. But the reason that we use MD5 over um, say for example, SHA-512 sum, is because MD5s are a lot easier to read just now. However, if we wanted to make this, you know, permissible in court, then perhaps we would want to be extra safe and use this SHA-512 sum. So in terms of digital forensics, once we have evidence and we've taken this hash sum of our evidence file, we can use this, this can be permissible in court, to show that the evidence has not been tampered with, okay? So if we just change one character in the evidence, it will completely change this hash signature here, this 512 sum. That's just a, a brief explanation of hash sums and, and hash collisions. Okay, so um, some other topics to cover. Environmental controls are and things that you'll put in position to reduce the risk of possible environmental damage taking place. Temperature control, temperature sensors, sprinkling systems, um, you know, fire alarms, fire exits, CCTV, key card locking doors, things like that. Okay, so the last topic today is about legal social and ethical implications. So we're going to look at some of the different legislation that we should be aware of. So the first thing to think about is government surveillance. So mass surveillance is an increasing concern in society. But how does this impact an organization's security? So the CCTV user group estimated that 1.5 million private and local government CCTV cameras are in city centres, stations, airports, and major retail areas in the UK. So research conducted by the Scottish Centre for Crime and Justice, based on a survey, identified that there are over 2,000 public space CCTV cameras in Scotland. So the thing to consider is, you know, is it legal to film people? Is it legal to film people? If you're an organization, can you film everyone all the time? What's the legal implications of that? What different acts do we have in place looking at that? So first one to think about is the Data Protection Act 2018. So we used to have an act in the UK called the Data Protection Act 1998. And this was replaced two, three years ago now um, with the Data Protection Act 2018. Now, the Data Protection Act 2018 is the UK's um, bringing in to force the regulation from the EU called the GDPR. So some people call the Data Protection Act 2018 the GDPR, but the GDPR is a regulation that was created by the EU. 
the GDPR, okay, is not the Data Protection Act 2018. So it was the case that, and some misinformed people think that the, the EU makes laws, and that's not true. The EU create regulations, and it's the responsibility of the member states of the EU to bring these into law. So we could have called this law anything we wanted, all right? But this Data Protection Act aligns the UK's data protection laws with the EU's general data protection regulation. So France will also have a data protection law that's called something else, probably something French, and they will use that law to bring them into line with the General Data Protection Act. So will the other member states, so will Spain, so will Italy, so will Portugal. So this act makes provision about processing of personal data and it's got seven principles. So how should data be used? Data should be lawful, um, the purpose should be limited. We should only keep the minimal amount of data on someone that we need. Data should be accurate. Um, data should be stored. Um, data should be secure. And data should be accountable. Okay, so those are the seven principles governing the Data Protection Act 2018. And the Data Protection Act 2018 brings into UK law the general data protection regulation. Now, the UK has, since this was released, left the EU. So we're no longer a member of the EU, but we are still, um, we still have this law in place. Okay, so what will happen in the future? We don't know. Most likely, if the EU updates its data protection laws, the UK will do that as well. Okay, so for example, the GDPR actually influenced data protection regulations all around the world. Okay, so they brought in laws in South America that were in line with the GDPR. They brought in laws in Japan that were in line with the GDPR. So you don't have to be a member of the EU to bring these into law. The good thing is, if you're not a member of the EU, you can choose not to. Okay, but it wouldn't make sense uh, not to in this case. So that's the Data Protection Act 2018. We also have the Freedom of Information Act 2000. Okay, so for example, if the local council hold information, you can make a Freedom of Information request to access that information. And in Scotland, we have our own version of it called Scotland's Own Freedom of Information, Scotland Act 2002. So in the UK, the Freedom of Information Act 2000 is superseded in Scotland by the Freedom of Information, Scotland Act 2002. So it covers any recorded information held by a public authority. The Computer Misuse Act. So the Computer Misuse Act 1990 is a piece of law that deals specifically with the crime of accessing and modifying data stored on computer systems. And there was actually, originally what happened was um, two hackers here remotely accessed one of BT's systems, okay? And they were able to find their way into Prince Philip's email account. And there's Prince Philip there, looking happy. Um, so that was why the Computer Misuse Act was originally brought into law. Just a little bit of trivia there. And they were able to, they were able to get the password to this using a technique called shoulder surfing. And shoulder surfing is just standing behind someone, looking over their shoulder, to watch them type in a password. Okay, it's an actual technique, shoulder surfing. Um, probably a more common application of shoulder surfing would be um, when you look over someone's shoulder to try and see uh, what it is they're typing 
on their phone. That's a more modern application of shoulder surfing. So we have the Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act, and this governs the use um, of covert techniques. So when the police or government departments need to use some sort of covert technique to get private information, they can use um, REPA. Okay, and this is nicknamed the Snoopers Charter. Okay, and what this is about is this is uh, was brought in under Theresa May's government, and this act requires that your internet service provider keeps all of your internet history for twelve months. Okay, um, so the police can ask to see your internet history uh, under this uh, investigatory powers act 2016. okay so those are the kind of laws that we need to be aware of those are the legislations we talked about risk we talked about risk mitigation we talked about different incidents and we talked about some legal guidelines there so that is topic three going to stop the recording now and see if anyone wants to ask any questions. How do you mitigate against phishing emails? Staff training is the best one. Anti-phishing software. I don't know if there's such a thing as anti-phishing software. Callum, um, let's have a look. Anti-software. Anti-phishing software. Maybe there is. Anti-phishing. Okay. Anti spyware with right, okay, fair enough. Not something I was familiar with. Anti phishing uh, software, fair enough, okay. Um, provide two methods of scanning audits and threat modeling. Uh, not bad. Um, the obvious one would be to run an anti malware scan. What's the difference between a guideline and a policy? So guidelines are suggestive, policy is, policy is mandatory. Perfect. Um, yep, that's perfect. What is a chain of custody? That's the process of tracking the movements of evidence once it's been collected. Exactly, that is exactly right. Putting things in bags labeled and stuff. Okay, what is a hash collision? Two files have the same hash, perfect. Um, an incident occurs when you lose a lot of data. You dial the number of your backup provider. Number doesn't work. What would prevent this? There we go. An escalation audit. Absolutely. Um, so I mean, and depending on how strange you are, you can you can I suppose add escalation audits to all different areas of your life. Um, you could do escalation audits everywhere if you were mad. How long? Uh, do you have to respond to a subject access request? Yeah, one month. You've been advised your organization should have an ICO number. Yeah, very good. REPA governs the interception of communications. Snoopers Charter. Now, I don't know if that's right. That's wrong. That's wrong. The Draft Communications Data Bill. I don't think... A real law would be called something like draft communication data bill. Okay. If we just go to our search and type in Snoopers Charter. Oh, maybe it is called that. <laughs> Me being an idiot. I thought it was called something else. Um I swear it what it never used to be called that. Right, hold on. The draft communications data bill was legislation. 
Okay, was legislation. Um, originally introduced, similar to... So what have they done with it then? Is it still... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, I think it's the Investigatory Powers Act. Um, Investigatory Powers Act 2016. Nicknamed the Snoopers Charter. That's it there. Sorry, this, this here is to do with it. Not to be confused. Oh, look. Legislation has also been nicknamed the Snoopers Charter. There's two. Okay. There's actually two. But the one I was thinking of is the Investigatory Powers Act. That is confusing, yeah. This is the one that you actually want. So let's just change that in here. I don't know what the draft communication da, 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 bill, where is it? Uh, let's get rid of that. That's the one you want. Right. What are the responsibilities of data processors under the Data Protection Act? Minimum data required for processing. Data should be accurate and secure. Yeah, perfect. And we have an answer from Tofik. Pseudo, right. What is pseudo? Pseudonymization, pseudon, pseudo, pseudonymization. Pseud I don't know how to say this. Pseudonymization is a method that allows you to switch the original set with an alias. That's fair play. Yeah. So, for example, if I had some data, let's say here, right? Let's do. I'll show you what. Now, I would actually pronounce it like pseudo anonymization, but it's actually just pseudo pseudonymization. So let's say I have some data and it's got like John, Alice, Mary, Bob, Michael, right? And beside it, it's got like numbers 100, 200. I don't know why I said 200 and 100, 250. Okay, 132. Okay, and I'll be, I'll have the most. I'll have 289. Right. So let's say that this turns out to be very sensitive data here. Okay. But we want to use this data somewhere. What we could do, okay, is take this data set, all right, and change these people to these. Okay. And what we've done is we've anonymized the data. Okay. Now, pseudo anonymize would mean that we can, you know, make sure that the data can't be tied back to the original people. So there's a really simple example there, like that. All right. Although this can really be tied because if you found this original file, you could probably figure out that Mary was C. Okay. So maybe we need something a bit more complicated than that. But that's very good. All of these are, all of these are fine. All right, um, if we do over here, it's probably not spelled right. Did I spell that correct? Okay, if you're American, you're going to spell it with a Z or a Z. Um, and let's, I would like to see an example of it though. Let's do, let's look for an image to see if we can see a little graphic of it. So there's a kind of open image in new tab. Here's an example of it here. Okay. So what, what, what this is saying is that we cannot figure out who these people are from this day here. So that's been anonymized with some random function. All right, to anonymize the data. So that's what that is. And the GDPR has a, a bit of information about that as well. Okay, so that is, um, that's topic three, folks. Um, on to the Moodle page, and I'll explain what the practical is for this week. So network security concept. So this week, we are editing our e-portfolio again with Lab 3. And Lab 3, okay, I don't know. This, this is the, let's say, we'll call that old. All right, that's the old. Um, so let's do, hide that, 
because we don't want to use this lab three. This is no use. We'll move that down here. So lab three this week, well, use, this used to be about Wi-Fi routers and things, but we don't have any Wi-Fi routers anymore because we're doing this online. But if this was, if we were in college today and there wasn't a lockdown, we would, I would go and get a, a big box of routers out and we could set them up. So we can't do that. So what there is, is there's a packet tracer scenario. So I'll assume that everybody knows how to use packet tracer. Okay, I'm just going to say everyone will know. So all you have to do is download the packet tracer file, open it, and then gather the following screenshots, add them to the ePortfolio, and answer this question. Okay, that's a packet tracer scenario that should run there. And what I'll do is I'll add these questions because these questions here, you might say, well, why are we doing these questions every week? What's the point? The point is that there's a test and you need to know all of this stuff uh, for the test. So let me just download a